Hello and welcome again to the Rider Review. This is Sarah Correct Rider. This week we're going to be doing a retro wrestling review. We're going to go back into time into 2008 for TNA's uh, fourth annual pay-per-view wrestling event called Bound for Glory 4. And uh, what can I tell you about this one? Okay, it was held at the Sears Center in Hoffman States, Illinois. TNA held its fourth annual Bound for Glory event. The Bound for Glory event is supposed to be marked as an equivalent to WWE's biggest show of the year, WrestleMania. It was located, I don't know if I've said it before, but I'll say it again. It's located at the Sears Center in Hoffman Estates, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. And uh, there were eight matches on the card and one dark match that was not televised. It was, of course, a mixed, or was it an intergender tag match between Eric Young and uh, Sojourner, or Sejourner Bolt versus Lance Rock, who, of course, we all know is uh, well, in WWE, he was Lance Archer. In any other outside promotions, he is Lance Hoyt. Anyway, the same guy. And Christy Hemi was his tag team partner. That was the only dark match that was there, but uh, it was not televised. Of those eight matches, four were for titles. And... Not quite Chicago, but in the Chicago area. It was chosen as the city of the event. Uh, they won over defeating New York City and Toronto as possible locations to where the event was to be held. Originally, Samoa Joe was to face Kevin Nash for the TNA World Heavyweight Champion. That idea, Kevin Nash was pulled out of the match. I don't know whether it was because of an injury or something, or simply because he didn't want to work with Samoa Joe over that nasty pipe bomb that he said about Scott Hall. Of course, obviously talking about his history with, with uh, battling alcohol addiction until he, of course, got sobered up and cleaned up thanks to DDP's Diamond Dallas Page's yoga. But uh, still back in 2007, he was still battling alcohol and drug addiction. And Samoa Joe just said some blatant, nasty thing about it. Of course, obviously, Kevin Nash was pissed off about the whole situation. So I guess he decided to just simply say, you know what, fuck you. I'm not going to work this I'm not going to work with him. Get someone else. But somehow management decided on having the legendary Sting face him instead. Hardcore legend Mick Foley recently signed up with TNA. And at the time was appointed a special guest enforcer for a match between Kurt Angle and Jeff Jarrett. Um... He was supposed to replace former NFL player and WCW wrestler Steve McMichael as the special guest referee, but TNA decided that they were going to have that they were going to have Steve McMichael be a part of the show, being the fact that he spent years with, of course, the Chicago Bears. He, of course, after his retirement from the NFL, he would go on to uh, be involved in wrestling. First, he was at WrestleMania 11, being one of the many football players who were in the corner for the main event match between football player Lawrence Taylor against Bam Bam Bigelow. And then he jumped ship to WCW where he did, you know, color commentating. He also uh, fought in the ring. He was a former United States heavyweight champion. So he was kind of brought back to the fold to be a special guest referee for the fatal four-way Monsters Ball match which came out later on. Prior to the event um, to 
spice up or to uh to to um give that chicago feel to this movie to this um to this uh pay-per-view several tna wrestlers would be dressed up like gangsters to promote this event which uh to me felt a bit offensive because of course we all know chicago was a great epicenter for a lot of gangster events including some famous gangsters who came out of there like al capone and John Dillinger, among many, many others. But to them, they were paying homage to the gangsters that were prominent figures during the 1920s and 1930s. Also, um, uh, there was the video package of the event from, of course, the TNA World Heavyweight Champion Samoa Joe. And one of the tag team participants in the Monsters Ball match with LAX, they shot video packages to promote the event. The event lasted pretty much slightly below the three-hour mark. Uh, the hosts for the event were Mike Tenay, who of course was a longtime uh, WCW color commentator who stayed pretty much with the company until it folded, and then he jumped ship to TNA. And he was also joined by the recently deceased Don West, who really brought the energy level to a great capacity. He probably didn't know shit from 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 wrestling moves, or like what Jim Cornette says, he didn't know the difference from a from a wrist lock to a wrist watch. That's one of his favorite quotes. Um, ring announcers were JB himself, Jeremy Borash, and David Penzer. Uh, referees, most notable ones, including Earl Hebner, Mark Slick Johnson, also Tracy Brooks was a special guest referee for for uh, the six-person bimbo brawl match. And we also had Steve McMichael, who served as a special guest referee, and Mick Foley was a special guest ringside um, enforcer. On the card, Jeremy Borash, who also uh, spent a lot of time in Jim Cornette's office, mostly interacting with Jim Cornette and Mick Foley, was there too. Lauren Thompson also was backstage during the being a backstage interview. Oh my God, she looks great. So we start off with a dark match, an intergender tag match. So I guess that means men and women can fight against each other. And it was uh, Eric Young and Sojourner Holt. I'm sorry about that. It's Holt, not Bolt. I must be thinking about the sprinter Usain Bolt. Now uh, taking on the team of Lance Rock and Christy Hemi. There isn't much talk about this match being that it was uh it was pre televised. Young and Holt were the winners, but Eric Knight is not over yet, as his alter ego, a Hurricane Helms superhero ripoff gimmick, was involved as we go was in place for him in the opening match of the night. So um oh shit. Uh okay, uh let's see, let me go down. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to start off with a Steel Asylum match for the number one contender for the TNA X Division Championship. It featured Alex Shelley, Jay Lethal, The Curry Man, that's of course Christopher Daniels, Chris Sabin, Sonjay Dutt, Jimmy Rave, Johnny Devine, Petey Williams, Shark Boy, and Super Eric. And uh, the the match is structured like a cage, but it's like almost like a hell in the cell type of structure, a little bit with a hole on top. And the only way to win is by escape, with your entire body going through the hole. And the winner will get to become the number one contender. For the X Division Championship. 
It's almost like a domed cage that was built very similar to WCW's Thunderdome. The, okay, now the match itself was really well executed. There was a lot of spots in this match, a lot of signature moves. It was a very quick pace. There was never a dull moment. But the problem with the match here was that there was just way too many participants involved. And more or less, the cage was not really fully used to the fullest capacity. Except, you know, maybe occasionally to annihilate opponents a bit with it. But really, it was more just a competitive, just to get out of the cage. But very few people were using it. Instead, the emphasis was mostly on them just doing their spot-on moves. You know, like the triple-decker, electric chair, superplex, or... Or uh, power bomb type Perican Rana stuff, and people just doing their finishing moves, their signature moves, and things like that. There was really not much about you know people trying to escape the cage. You know, it was just just people doing all their signature moves. And while that might excite a lot of people, the real concept of the match was to escape. There was way too many spot fests, and it took quite a while. Before someone actually tried to escape the cage. If I'm trying to be positive. It's a good way to kick off the evening. Like you would expect at a major event like Wrestlemania or Starcade. And it did its job to get the crowd excited. That's great. But this was just one big clusterfuck of wrestlers. That didn't have any real story feud except for possibly maybe Jay Lethal and Sanjay Dutt. Therefore, I give this one two stars. Lethal wins the match by escape. And the with the intentional help from his rival Sanjay Dutt. Two stars out of ten. We get a backstage segment with Jim Cornette. Mick Foley, as he tells a sexy story to Stan Lane and Cornette, is very busy and assigns Foley to watch the office until he gets back. And then uh, all of a sudden, the beautiful people come in. They're complaining because there's no blue Skittles in their M&Ms. They started throwing it, and Mick Foley, in comical forms, tries to catch it with his mouth and then says some kind of sexist comment about, you know, well, they, they, they scoff at his, 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 his jacket because it was made out of chamois. But he said, you know, I'd rather like to be in velvet. <laughs> Very funny. All right, next up we have a match that's called a Bimbo Brawl match. You heard me right. This, mo this match was complete shit. But it happened. Okay, we have... ODB, which stands for One Dirty Bitch, teaming up with Raka Khan and Rhino to take on the beautiful people and the former Billy Gunn, who now goes by the name of Cute Hip. Uh, special guest referee was Tracy Brooks. It's still a traditional one fall six person tag match. It's an intergender, so. Men and women can fight against each other. This match was actually quite messy as there was a lot of botches and miscues. However, the biggest mistake comes when Velvet Sky pie faces Rhino. Did she learn anything from ECW? Rhino doesn't give a fuck about, about males being violent with females. Hell, he has gored females through tables. He once piled drove the Sandman's wife through a table and sore backed her. This match deserves one real one stars. There was no real payback, just filler. Rhino pins Kip after her signature move. The gore, gore, gore. One star. Let us move on. All right, next up we have is the X Division Championship match. And it's Sheikh Abdul Bashir. will take on uh, Consequences Creed, who would, of course, go into WWE under the name Xavier Woods. 
he would have more success there. Um, Xavier Woods or Consequences Creed, of course, he was playing hom homage to Apollo Creed from the uh, Rocky movies. By the way, rest your soul, rest in peace, Carl Weathers. You are a great, talented guy who will be sorely missed. Of course, you know, Sheikh Abdul Bashir was kind of, I hate to say, use these terms, he was coming off as, you know, like, uh, like, uh, like a foreign villain heel character. Um, yeah, even though he's not really from Tehran, Iran, he's actually a Muslim American from Minneapolis, Minnesota. This is Dabari, who was, of course, once the manager for, uh, Mohammed Hassan, Mohammed Hassan. You may have remembered Mark Gopani, a.k.a. Mohammed Hassan, who was supposed to portray an Arab American who is disdained because his people have been criticized during the whole post-9-11 stuff. Well, this uh, shows just how classy wrestling could be as Bashir's gimmick was an expunge, was to expunge all Arab anti-Arab hatred Americans were, especially after the Gulf War and 9-11. And mind you, let's face it, he is American from Minnesota. But he's, of course, doing that whole foreign heel villain thing. It feels something like Hulk Hogan pulled off over a decade and a half ago by taking a real war and making it into his angle. They did that a little bit with the whole 9-11 thing with uh, Bashir. And they went far to bring a real Iraqi war veteran to announce Creed. I thought that was really nice. The match itself was fine as it was as it kind of felt like watching a WWE style match. As both men can work really well together. But it was still very meh to say the least. Uh, Bashir actually wins after Creed tries to go for a surprise roll-up. But somehow Bashir somehow manages to cheat, putting his hands on the ropes. Bashir is still the X Division champion. I made a mistake about Creed winning the match. No, he didn't. It was Bashir. It is the xenophobic foreign heel gimmick idea that ruined it all. And this type of gimmick just simply needs to stop. Not all foreigners have to be xenophobic, anti-American, while at the same time being considered to be villains in this just because they have a hatred towards America. And if you're not down with the Americans, you're going to be a villain. Okay, I know this is a gimmick that Bashir has because he's actually American from Minnesota. But this anti-American stuff by foreign wrestlers is just old school stuff. I give it two stars. Backstage, you see Mick Foley talk about King of the Ring 98. And then, um, speaking of cultural appropriation, we have uh, Awesome Kong walks in with her voice box, her manager, protege. Her name is uh, Rashida Saeed, who, of course... Underneath that hijab, she's actually a Caucasian woman who, of course, wrestled in TNA under the name Cheerleader Melissa. But, hey, you put her in a hijab, you make her speak with a foreign accent by rolling her arms, and all of a sudden now, she's a Muslim. And, of course, she disdains about 
how Taylor Wilde has has uh, has costed her matches and has made Awesome Kong look like a fool. And of course, she says something about it doesn't matter, which is one of the catchphrases of The Rock. Foley lectures her about her gimmick, about gimmick infringement. And he says that she probably needs a little assistant from Yerpel the Clown. Yerpel the Clown, if you remember back in the Attitude Era, back in late 90s, uh, Yerpel the Clown was involved in two angles, including the whole Here Is Your Life segment with The Rock. You know, before the Rock and Sock connection. And Yerpel the Clown was also instrumental in cheering up Vince McMahon when he was convalescing from an injury in the hospital. Of course, you know, it was all escalated with Steve Austin banging in the head with a bedpan and shit like that. Anyways, we have a triple threat match for the TNA Knockouts Championship. As the champion Taylor Wilde, who has been somehow managing to outsmart her much larger and more scarier opponent, Awesome Kong. And we also gonna throw in Roxy in the mix. To me, Kong has always been, in my opinion, probably one of the great monster heels in the ring. I mean, I mean she was a legitimate badass. Okay, she's not some fucking fat, doughy slob like, like Nia Jax. Kong, sure she was big, but she was built, she was a monster, and she's like right up there with a lot of other great monster type wrestlers, like Vader, like Undertaker, like Kane. And TNA always ensured that if Kong gets defeated, it's either never done fairly or she's not going to be the one to get the pin. She was actually quite protected in TNA. But it's just a shame that this match lasted only about five minutes. But there was some good highlights, including Kong using her size and all, delivering a crossbody on both Wild and Roxy. Roxy tries to go for her finish but is met with a German suplex. Taylor Wilde wins and keeps the title. It wasn't a bad match, and Wilde shows she has greatness in spite of her in-ring limitations. I gave it two and a half stars, but then Kong would beat Wilde two weeks later on in the for the belt. Backstage, AJ Styles tells Foley that he likes him better than the rest of the other guys who got picked up by TNA from the other company. And then all of a sudden, the Team 3D brother Ray comes in, calls AJ a mark, and shows that he's got no respect. And then all of a sudden, um, there was, of course, a, a bit of a an old ECW, WWE reunion between uh, Team 3D and Mick Foley with, uh, of course, Bully Ray or Brother Ray calling Mick Foley Cactus, like in Cactus Jack, and things like that. You know, Jim Cornette says that he's assigned a referee for the match later on for the, um, four-way Monsters Ball match, and it is for the TNA Tag Team Championship. And the participants in this match include James Storm and Bobby Roode, who are collectively known as Beer Money, and they take on the team of Matt Morgan and Abyss, Team 3D, Brother Ray and Brother Devon, and Latin American Exchange or LAX for short. That is the team of Hernandez and Homicide with special guest referee, former Chicago Bear, Steve Mongo McMichael, who sadly looks really out of it. I mean, he looks kind of bloated and out of shape. He can barely walk. 
he kind of looks sad. I mean, you know, back in the 90s, you know, he was compact. He was tough. He was legitimate. Now he looks kind of doughy, out of shape. And by God, he has aged. Yes, I know we don't get younger as we go along. We get older. But by God, he really let himself go. It's basically a fatal four-way match with weapons highly encouraged. And the first team to get the fall, be it pin or submission, is the winner. It's, I mean, it's something like you would probably expect. There's a lot of great spots. There's a lot of great highlights to it, including, you know, Team 3D doing the lighter fluids and putting a flaming table and Abyss getting speared and then getting engulfed in flames. Fortunately, the the pyrotechnics and the backstage crews were there to put out the fire before things started to get worse. Just like you thought it was kind of violent in this match. You know, there was, uh, I believe, one of the members of LAX was like, like digging a fork into Brother Devon's skull. Um, Abyss bleeds in the match. You know, there was some highlights too, including uh, James Storm wearing that beer helmet and wanted to do a little bit of some football stances, you know, with uh, Steve McMichael. Yeah, uh, Steve McMichael also delivers a clothesline. The thing was about this match that kind of weakened things a bit was that McMichael, uh, he did quite a lot of slow counts, which really frustrated people. Matt Morgan was also pretty quite effective in the ring, including doing some high spots for a relatively big man. But it was kind of what you would expect it to be. There was some great heel heat. The turning point came when Hernandez failed to open a bag of thumbtacks. And then McMichael opened it up for him. Spread the thumbtacks all over the table. Team 3D delivered the 3D maneuver on Hernandez. But Beer Money somehow managed to steal the victory. And remain the tag team champions. This match gets three and a half stars. Mostly because the points were taken off. Because of the slow counts from McMichael. Which was frustrating. But still. You know nonetheless. Not a bad match here. Clearly the best match on the night. Next up we had. Was a triple threat match. Now usually I'm not a fan of multiple men matches or multiple women matches unless there's something like at stake like a title or a contract or a number one contendership or whatnot. This was just a triple threat match for the sake of one to put on a triple threat match. So we had Booker T versus Christian Cage versus AJ Styles. It seems that TNA was really going for Booker T to win this contest but still because, you know, apparently there was this whole thing going on between the younger generation versus the older generation. It seemed that the baby faces were mostly leaned towards the the older people. But it seems that the fans just seemed to gravitate towards the younger people. And the fans seemed to more or less cheer for AJ. And the reason why is because, you know, AJ Styles was the face of the company. You know, it didn't matter whether he was a baby face or a heel. He can play off those roles quite quite evenly good without really necessarily having to change his personification too much. I mean, sure, back in 2008, Booker T might have had a few years left of him, but he kind of pretty much lost his appeal since leaving the WWE and the King Booker gimmick. Hey, but I still love me some Harlem Heat. I love that he made the transition in the late 90s when he stopped teaming with his brother Stevie Ray 
to for to go on his own. He became a top single star. He became a five-time WCW World Heavyweight Champion. He came to WWE. He was involved in many title matches. He won titles there too, including the World Heavyweight Champion that he beat Rey Mysterio for. He became King Booker and you know Queen Charmel. Great stuff there for him. But really in WCW, but really in TNA, he's just, you know, another face in the crowd. The fans are also tired out after that energetic, violent match they witnessed before. But there was still enough to get them to root for AJ. The match wasn't too bad. Nothing really. It felt more WWE-like than TNA. AJ Styles looked good in the match. While Christian and Booker were just phoned in a WWE style type match in the ring. Using all their patented moves. Um, I liked the idea that Booker T, if they still wanted to win the match, I'm glad they didn't let Christian take, I mean, AJ Styles get the pin, but let Christian Cage get the pin. I know the reason why they did that is because I think at that time, Christian Cage was... I think his contract with TNA expired, and of course he would go back to WWE, drop the cage last name, go back to just being plain old Christian. The match ends when Christian goes for the unprettier, but Booker T axe kicks him from the top rope. Christian and gets the pin. This match gets a two and a half stars because AJ definitely turned in the best performance here, but TNA chose Booker instead to get the win. Then we go backstage. Kurt Angle is, you know, unsure if this is going to be just a one fall match. And he also does not like the idea of Mick Foley being a backstage, uh, being a special guest enforcer for this match. He was hoping that he was going to get a solid one fall match. But obviously that's not going to be the case. Mick Foley is going to be a special guest enforcer for this match. Um, here's the thing, too. Is I guess in this match between Kurt Angle and Jeff Jarrett, I guess Jeff Jarrett is going to play off the babyface role. He was out of wrestling for a couple of years because of injuries, even questioning of whether he was going to come back as an active competitor. Of course, you know, he was going through a lot of stages. I believe, I think his wife died. Of course, she left behind. Aside from him, three daughters, all of them are spelt J. Hmm, I guess that means if I was a Jarrett, my name would not be Eric, but Jarek? Okay, fine, my name is Jarek Jarrett. No, I'm just kidding. No, no. Anyways, anyways, Jarrett cuts a promo dedicating this match to his kids, to his deceased wife. You know, it was a it was a fine package. I don't know whether this was like legit. I know Jeff Jarrett was trying to do everything he can to make it seem legit. I don't know who was supposed to even play the the baby face for this match. Because it seemed like Jeff Jarrett was doing a lot of heelish stuff. Kurt Angle said that, you know, since when Jarrett was absent, he was carrying the company. And then I say to myself, well, what the hell is wrong with that? He carried the company. Anyways, Mick Foley is a special guest ring enforcer. And I got to say, you know, Angle and Jarrett, you know, they're at their A game here. They do all their spot on moves. Great technical match, if you really want to know. Um, Angle performs... Like a, like he's at his top of the game, so is Jeff Jarrett. You know, it's very competitive. Great scientific fights. They were all trying to go for their finishers. Whether it's a suplex or a submission hold. The angle slam. Jarrett, you know, he could strike when he can. He and Angle had some great ring chemistry. Whether he's in the ring or Jarrett, you know, breaks the ankle lock and then a ref bump. Uh, occurs, Mick Foley comes in, the turning point came when Foley encouraged Angle to hit him, Angle did hit him with a chair, and then 
Both he and Jarrett get chaired. Foley now then sells the move. Then he pulls out Mr. Socko and does the mandible claw and angle. Another equalizer. And then a hit in the head with the acoustic guitar. Jarrett gets um gets his finishing move. I forget what the name is. It's like a version of the skull crushing finale. He gets the three count. I give this match four stars because it was good until the booking had to intervene. And then we come to our main event for the uh, TNA World Heavyweight Championship, Samoa Joe versus Sting. The only gripe Sting has with Joe is that he doesn't respect him. He says that, you know, hey, I had to, hey, when I broke into wrestling, I had to show respect to my elders. I want Joe to do the same for me, you know, things like that. There really was no major gripe between the two. And besides, Sting was just thrown in as a replacement for Kevin Nash. That was really all. There was a mixed reaction from the fans. I think more fans actually were leaning towards Sting, even though Sting was playing off as the heel. And Samoa Joe was pretty much the baby face in this. But of course, because Sting is just a guy who's been loved and admired for many, many years. I mean, he's just got that natural bravado. You know, you can't really turn the guy heel. I mean, I mean, the guy is obviously a legend. Such highlights include when Sting and Samoa Joe are fighting in the crowd. And Joe does some kind of insane drop kick from the stairs. Oh my god, that was so fucking painful. Onto the steps. I mean, how did Samoa Joe not break his back or broke any limbs from doing that devastating, dangerous maneuver? Some other highlights include them no selling their respective moves, like Sting giving Samoa Joe the muscle buster. And Joe is like, mm, is that all you can do? And then Joe does the Samoan death drop on Sting. And Sting just picks himself up and does the same thing. No sells the moves. Sting kind of feels weak and vulnerable. Like he was when he fought Vader in 92. Even though Sting, you know, manages to just bounce back. He attempts a comeback, but they're multiple times poorly executed. Sting gets some offense, while there are times when Joe just looks like an idiot. The match ends when Kevin Nash comes down. Sting tries to get the bat, but Kevin Nash takes the bat from him, while the ref is out cold temporarily after a bump. And then Kevin Nash decides to take the bat and hit Joe. Sting applies the Scorpion Death Lock for the win, Death Drop for the win. And is the new TNA champion. It gets two and a half stars because it showed promise until the genius booking came and it just messed it up real quickly. Overall, I give this a 5 out of 10 star rating here. They made a lot of bad decisions on who to put over to making veterans like Sting be the champion. While at the same time, they, he's just still, you know... Like past his prime. Franchise players like AJ Styles jobbing out to Booker T was disgraceful to a guy who's dedicated to this promotion. Kurt Angle being defeated by Jeff Jarrett. I know he was doing this for his daughters for this win. But still, it makes me wonder why is it that a baby face like Jeff Jarrett is doing heelish stuff? It feels like watching an old WCW reboot. And it's such a shame for your biggest show of the year. So when all is said and done. Uh, like I said I give this one a 5 out of 10. I would love to do more retro wrestling reviews. But nonetheless. Um, tell me what you think about this. If you should leave a comment. Go right ahead. If you wish to. Leave me some questions or some answers. Please feel free to do so.
you wish to subscribe to my channel, go right ahead. But if you're going to leave a comment, just remember the three simple rules. Be kind, be courteous, and please refrain from any rude comments. And I'll be back again with another review. So until next time, this is Eric Rutrider saying so long, everyone. And I will be back again to do another movie review. And um, take good care of yourselves, everyone. Okay? Goodbye.